Welcome from Anne and me to the Odeon Leicester Square. Tonight, in the presence of the Prince and Princess of Wales, the new Jim Henson movie, Labyrinth, is premiered. The audience, no doubt, intrigued to see the latest creation of the man who brought us the Muppets. It is, in the words of the makers, a magical world of fantasy and adventure. And it is, in the words of the viewers, a pretty good film, isn't it? It's certainly it's different. It's really unusual. We caught it uh, last week, and it's really a good film, so stay tuned. Let me just tell you about it. Labyrinth is really about the adventures and dangers undergone by a young girl called Sarah. She's only about 14, and so is the actress. She's Jennifer Connolly. Now, Sarah is trying to rescue her infant brother, who's been captured by the goblins. And she has to overcome the rather dark powers of the king of the goblins, Jareth, who's played by David Bowie. The world that Sarah enters exists in her own imagination, and the film draws heavily on the books she's reading as she grows up. So, any similarity to Alice in Wonderland or Wizard of Oz isn't exactly coincidental. And the film, in fact, with the world that she enters, has a special feeling that reflects the stories that have so impressed her as a young child. Well, David Bowie's co-star in the film is a young American actress called Jennifer Connelly, who virtually made the movie in her school holidays. Jim Henson chose her out of hundreds of young actresses who he auditioned on both sides of the Atlantic. He said she was exactly the right person for the film. And David Bowie has said some extremely nice things about her too. Apart from being quite beautiful, she's a really good actress. And she's a pleasure to work with. One forgets that she's just 14 years old and she's really very mature. And it's a big strain, the film like this. And every day without fail, she was on the form. And she's absolutely terrific. Now she's just dynamite. Jennifer, it's a wonderful accolade. Do you think you can handle it? I think so, yeah, I think so. What did you think of him? Of, of David. David Bowie. Oh, yeah. he was wonderful. He was wonderful to work with. He's such a sweet, sweet person, you know. Could you believe it when you got the part that you and he would practically be the only human beings in the film? I was uh, <laughs> very excited, yeah. Now look, you're 15 now, soon to be 16. On yes, the, a couple of weeks on the 12th. Congratulations December. on that. Thank you. But it's an even uh, higher achievement because you are very young, really, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Is it true that you had to have lessons on the set during some of this? I did. I did. I had tutoring on the set. Um, what I did is I brought all my work over from America and just I just learned it on the on the set. In and then at the, at the very end of everything, you went back to school. Yes, back to America. Back did you to New York. did you walk back into school a huge star? No, I think I I walked into school the same person who just had a wonderful summer. You know. And what are you going to do? Are you just going to look upon it as a wonderful summer or the start of a fantastic career? I'd like to see it as a, the start of something which will continue, you know, but also some nice memories. Any particular ideas? Because I've read that you would still like to go to university first. I would, I would. Um, maybe not first, I'd like to continue both, see if I can do it at the same time. Um, There's a lot of thinking to do, really. A lot to do, yeah. Now, what was it like working with puppets instead of animals? I can imagine at some points it might have been frightening. Yeah, um, it wasn't... It wasn't really frightening. It's it's difficult. It takes a lot of concentration, and um, it's something you really have to get used to and just sort of accept and work with, as opposed to try and work against. You know, because um, it takes a lot of time, a lot of patience. But sometimes it was a little frightening. Sometimes it was, you know. Did you ever start to look upon them as real? Um, sometimes, yeah. They real in the sense that they all have their own personalities. You know, so their own character. Tonight's royal premiere is an aid of the Museum of the Moving Image, a new museum soon to be opened on the South Bank Arts Centre. There, alongside the theatre, music, painting and sculpture, the distinctive art form of the 20th century will take its proper place, television and film. Tonight's event, in fact, is the culmination of fundraising that started back in 81 in the presence of the Prince and Princess of Wales. It ends tonight, appropriately enough, in their presence again. Now, the museum itself is the idea of two men, the curator of the National Film Archive, David Francis, and the controller of the National Film Theatre, Leslie Hardcastle. Leslie's with me right now. Leslie, first of all, what is this museum all about? Why have you decided that this is a good idea? Well, the Museum of the Movie Image will trace uh, mankind's quest 
to record moving images from the days of the Chinese shadow plays right up to laser beam photography today. And it'll take into account the development of cinema and television as major force in all our lives. Why do you think it's so important to have this museum? Well, I think together with the motor car and the wireless telegraph, probably cinema and television are probably the two most important inventions of man uh, for communication that's ever been invented. And our museum will trace the whole story, both of television and film, and how it's developed. It's uh, one of a breed of new museums. It's not such a museum of artifacts, although we do have artifacts from um, Charlie Chaplin's cane and hat to the Muppets, but it's a participatory museum, a hands-on museum. What, you mean and people can actually get involved yeah, themselves? Yeah. In what way? Well, we hope that, for instance, the mother will uh, be dealing with the... Uh, reading the news at 10 while the father is trying to control the sound and the son is downstairs in an animation group uh, making the animation film while they're in the museum and then they'll show it before they leave. You mean uh, I actually could go in and read news at 10 myself? Uh, yes. I mean it's the whole world of film and television. Sir Richard Attenborough is with me. Uh, it's, it's, it's lovely to see you here. Of course, yeah. it's a lovely night because yet, it's, uh, again, it's a wonderful British film. Yes, it is. It's uh, all the major expertise is British. And so it makes one very proud that the style and calibre of special effects, using a very broad phrase, is so revered for the work done in this country that people come from all over the world. We British seem to be very good at that, don't we? We are indeed. Yeah. We are indeed. And to a certain extent, I mean, a lot of people would say that you kicked it all off by giving the British film industry something to be proud of again. But gracious me, I don't think that's a terrible exaggeration. I don't think that's true at all. No, I, I, I'm involved to the extent that I like making movies here. I don't want to go anywhere else, to the United States or anywhere. Although I make the movies in different countries, they are essentially British pictures. But I know that you're very proud to be here tonight because of your work with the museum, for instance, yes. that uh, tonight is all about. Yes. The, the museum is a brainchild of the British Film Institute, or rather the brainchild of Charles Beddoes and Leslie Hardcastle and David Francis, who are all involved with the Institute. And it will be the greatest educational toy, I think, in London. I mean, it will be miraculous when it's completed, in that a whole understanding of the way in which picture in television or in film is achieved and has originated. Uh, will be embodied within this museum. And it's for setting up that museum that the whole royal premiere of Labyrinth is, it is uh, taking it is. place we tonight. Had to, had to raise eight million pounds. I don't know how you do it. Well, really. we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but David Bowie is the big star. He Are you into pop music? Not really, as much as I used to be. I'm a very old man now, so I'm not as into it as. <laughs> but I'm an enormous admirer of David Bowie. So I think he's not only remarkable in terms of the pop music world in which he operates, but he's moved right out of that as well, as evidenced tonight. He is a, a major movie personality, and his understanding and use of uh, camera and cinema is very remarkable. And among the celebrities here tonight is Margot Kidder, the actress back in Superman. You must be delighted to be back in Superman. What is it? Superman 4. We're all getting older. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. What have you been doing today? Oh, I've been flying all day, so I'm a bit dizzy. I feel rather like I'm going to throw up any minute. But now, when you say flying, can you specify flying, what you mean exactly? Hanging from wires in an extremely uncomfortable harness from the ceiling of a sound stage and being shot across it by several men and filmed in the process. What, what do you uh, actually wear for that? Well, you wear the most uncomfortable harness under your clothes, and then uh, big things coming out the side, put the clothes over top, and they mm -hmm. hang you off from the ceiling, and off you go. you frightened when you're doing that? No, I used to hang glide, so it's kind of a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you enjoying yourself over in England? Oh, I love it. I don't want to go back. I adore it here, yeah. yeah. Now, d talking about your own personal ambitions, you're quite keen, aren't you, to direct yes. and write yourself? It always sounds so pretentious when actresses say that and haven't quite done it. I've done a little bit of directing, and I have done some writing, so I feel that I'm part way there, but I've been at acting for, I'm not going to say how many years, but since I was 16 years old, so quite a few. And I think after a while, it kind of worse thin, you want to take the reins yourself and have some control. So is there any chance that you will be doing something in that line? Yes, I can. I'm very lucky because I'm Canadian, see, and I get to go home and um, try out my skills and fail in the less conspicuous way than falling on your face um, in Hollywood's eyes and on a lower budget, obviously, in a more personal film. So that's in the works and hopefully pretty soon. Brian Froud is with me. He is the conceptual designer. It sounds extremely posh, but what does it mean? It means just sitting down and having fun with a sketch pad and a pencil 
sure it's not that simple. In fact, I understand that the labyrinth itself, this sort of weird, sinister maze that Sarah has to go through, is your idea. Yes, only because I knew you could have so much fun with it, and within a labyrinth you could have so many exciting different characters for, for me to draw. Well, you certainly have got an incredible amount of characters. Did they start all inside your head? Yes, I just basically, yes. Um, I mean, I, I understand that you sort of sketch your ideas out. Yes. But when you see somebody actually form them into puppets, and then onto the screen so that they become animals or characters, are they what you intended? Yes, because a lot of hard work goes in between making the initial sketch and the finished product you see on the screen. And are you there for that? Every single moment. You were sort of hanging around the studio, yes. wringing your hands. poking around and making my presence felt, yes. Yeah. Did you also, I mean, you, you were explaining just to me earlier that you were working with Terry Jones. Uh, he must have been fun to work with, I can imagine. Yes, because um, I've developed some ideas for characters that have been in the film originally, but when Terry came along, that he saw a whole new set of characters that were hidden away in some of my sketches. So he brought those out to the floor, and so we got a, a new look to the film. Welcome back to the Odeon Leicester Square. For this, the royal premiere of the Jim Henson movie, Labyrinth. Very shortly, their royal highnesses, the Prince and Princess of Wales, will be arriving here to be presented to the stars and makers of the movie. It's a very amusing film, and that's not uh, really very surprising, because the screenplay is written by Terry Jones. Terry, congratulations on the film. <laughs> you are fascinated by weird creatures, aren't you? Well, yes, you know, you, that's who you're married to, really, doesn't it? But um, they are, these are wonderful creatures. I mean, I, I remember seeing Jim's last film, uh, Dark Crystal, and it was only sort of about a day later I suddenly realised I just watched the entire film and it was there was not a single human being in the film and I just hadn't thought about it. I mean, did the creatures just seemed to be alive in such an extraordinary way? Yeah. Because I, I don't know whether you remember that moment in when he saw sort of Return to the Jedi of the Jedi. No, was it Return of the Jedi? What's it called? I don't know that Star Wars. Return Second, of the Jedi, yeah. Yeah, the second, second Star Wars sort of thing. And there was this little creature with the pixie ears like that. And I remember looking at that and thinking, what is that? It can't be a dummy. It must be something else. And I, I just it was just that was the first time I really realised the magic that, that Jim had with the, the, these things, puppets, I suppose you call them. <laughs> something screamed at me at my Monty Python during this film. That what was the that? bog of eternal stench. The bog. Well, actually, that was not my idea. That was, I have to say, that was Jim's idea, the bog of eternal stench. That sort of a, that was handed. You know, so uh, when I was writing the script, um, it was a, uh, an odd experience for me in a way because uh, it wasn't my idea or anything. And I, what I was doing, I was writing from ideas that were already existing. And basically, my sort of method was having this pile of uh, drawings that Brian Froud had done. And I was just sort of writing through. And every time I came to a scene, I wanted a new character. I'd look through these drawings. And there'd be this drawing of the the, the the guy with the hat that talked. And it was so obvious, the hat talked. So I just had to write the scene with this guy with a hat that talks, <laughs> this wise man. How did you get involved with Jim Henson? Well, I actually rang up his office to try and see if he'd uh, get involved in a film that I was uh, setting up called uh, Eric Viking. Um, and he said, uh, well, actually, I've got this idea. Why don't you get involved with this film that I'm doing? So um, it, 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 that's how it happened. We had dinner, you know, all these things happen over dinner. <laughs> I must say, something I particularly liked was that cameo sketch of the, the worm. Oh, on no, the don't, uh, don't mention that one, because I tried, that was the one chance I had to perform in the film. I tried doing the voice for it, and it, I failed dismally, and it's now, uh, I think it's uh, somebody else's voice. I think it's Jim's son doing the voice, actually. Is that right? Brian Henson. Sure. Brian, I think so. Mariel Hemingway is with me. She's not actually in this film, but she is in the middle of making another one, and that's Superman 4. You're the new editor of the Daily Planet. I sure am. Yeah, it's my new job. A powerful lady. Yeah. And yeah. the new romance in Clark Kent's life? Absolutely. I um, am the one person who's not fascinated by Superman. <laughs> Oh, you're a bit cynical and hard, are yeah, you? Yeah, uh, no, I just think that Superman's sort of dull, and I think Clark Kent, Kent is rather wonderful. I so. bet he wins you over, doesn't he? Clark Kent or Superman? Um, Superman either. I become friends with, but Clark Kent is still the, the, you know, the love of my life, I suppose. You're filming at this very moment, aren't yes. you? Yes, yeah. we're just wrapping up principal photography. Are you flying? Yes, I've been flying the past week. Is it fun? It's terrific fun. It's, uh, it makes you a little dizzy for a couple of days afterwards. It's rather unnerving, but it's great fun. It must be a bit frightening, too. Well, I like heights, and I used to have a trampoline when I was a kid, so I like all that. So. I suppose if you're in the arms of Superman, it doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> Joined by the man who made it all possible, the man who created Labyrinth, Jim Henson. Good evening to you, Jim. Congratulations. Good evening. Thank do you, you do feel very excited on a night like this? Oh, yeah. This is, uh, this is a big thrill. 
because even when we're working on the film, we think, oh, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we were to have a royal premiere? And, and you don't really know that's going to happen until uh, a few months ago. And it's, it's very exciting for me. So what inspired you to think up this particular story? Well, it's, it was really a few of us. Uh, I've said, you know, a lot of times that a film like this is very much a collaboration. And it was Brian Fraud and Terry Jones, uh, George Lucas, uh, myself. Uh, Dennis Lee, who's a Canadian poet, was part of the early thinking of the story, and uh, it really came from all of us. When you have, when you have a film that's a, a good collaboration, uh, you don't even know who thought of what. You know, at the end of it, you merely have this thing that everybody worked on together, and we had a terrific time making this film. And, and uh, in the underlying story, there is a, a sort of fascinating conflict between good and evil, isn't there? David Bowie, Jennifer Connelly. Yes, it's uh, it's sort of about a girl growing up, and it's about uh, it's an adventure story first of all, and a, and, and a, and a conflict, and, and uh, her getting through this labyrinth and trying to rescue her baby brother, and uh, at the same time, it's it's not exactly good and evil. I think David Bowie, what we wanted from him was not particularly evil, but we wanted uh, somebody who was both attractive to uh, Jennifer and also dangerous. And, and so you get sort of a push and pull coming out of this particular character. I love David in the film, and he was terrific to work with. And what, what goes on inside your mind? I'd love to see inside your brain. Do you think creatures all the time? Oh, no, not, not particularly. Every now and then when you go down the street, you, you see somebody who say, oh boy, that guy would make a wonderful puppet. But actually, most of our characters don't come from real people. They always come from ideas and types of personalities and things like that. But as I say, uh, you know, creatures come from a lot of different people. And all the creatures in this film were designed by Brian Froud. And, and he's got a wonderful mind. I mean, it's, he is so uh, imaginative. And he just did pages and pages of, of sketches, and uh, which, is, which were all wonderful. Well, we wish you all success with it, Jim Henson. Congratulations. Thank, and thank you very you. much. Okay. Thank you. And I have to say, I make no secret of the fact that my favorite character in the film is Sir Didymus, a British sort of stiff upper lip, lip character who defends the bridge over the bog of eternal stench. Here comes the car now with the Prince and Princess of Wales who are arriving for the royal premiere tonight of Labyrinth. And it was raining outside earlier, but it seems to have cleared up just in time for the royal arrival. Big crowds outside already. And there is the princess. Oh, <laughs> great cheer from the crowd just Doesn't at the side of her. She looks terrific. She looks lovely. And the Prince of Wales too. And there's the general manager, Mr. Alan Harris Quelch, bringing in the royal couple. There they're meeting Sir Richard Attenborough and Mr. Anthony Smith, who will be presenting the guests to them tonight. Mr. Anthony Smith will present Mr. David Francis, who's curator of the National Film Archive, and Leslie Hardcastle, who's controller of the National Film Theatre. Those two, in fact, were the men whose idea it was to found the Museum of the Moving Image. <laughs> and of course, it is money towards that that this evening is all about. Shall I tell you a little about the princess's dress? She's wearing a dress designed by one of her favorite designers, Catherine Walker of the Chelsea Design Company. It's in ivory duchess satin with a sort of beaded top and it's gathered with a bow as you can see on the hip. The princess in fact first wore this dress at a state reception in Oman on her recent trip to the Gulf States. And in fact Catherine Walker designed a great many of her outfits for that trip. Princess's hair of course cut in that lovely short bob by her hairdresser Richard Dalton. And amongst the people, the royal couple meeting at the moment, are those involved specifically with the museum from the research side of course. And also on the building side, the architect, Mr. Brian Avery, and representatives of the builders, and the designer. And so they progress up the stairs to meet the stars and the makers of the movie itself. And of course, some of the leading people involved with raising money.
towards the museum fund. Yes, in fact, members of the uh, particular committee that organise all of these premieres and royal premieres, um, all of them charitable events. <laughs> the prince has already spied Ludo, I think. Ludo is one of the monsters from the film, and I think uh, they've already caught sight. I must take issue on the word monster. He's a very <laughs> friendly chap, really. <laughs> That is, of course, Lady Howe, who the, the princess is speaking to at the moment, Sir Geoffrey Howe's wife. And Sir Geoffrey himself is here tonight, but you can perhaps just see him <laughs> talking oh, yes. there to Princess Diana. Lady Howe is actually chairman of the Museum Fundraising Committee, so she'll be especially pleased um, to see tonight going so well. As um, Sir Richard Attenborough was saying, they have to raise £8 million. <laughs> They meet Mr. Jim Daly, who's Managing Director of Rank Film and Television Services, and uh, David Matalon, who's the President of TriStar Pictures. <laughs> I wonder if the Prince and Princess are thinking, I wonder if this will be a suitable film for the Princes. Actually, it would be, wouldn't it? They're just the right age. Yes, I think so. It's, uh, it's very attractive to children, but it also is attractive to the older generation in a completely different way. It's fascinating. It's spectacular. Well, that's because we adults are trying to figure out exactly how they've managed uh, to, to portray these characters. We adults are thinking how it's done, but I should think the children just sit back and enjoy it. And take it for granted. Mm, that's right. Princess, of course, very interested in visual arts. I mean, I know she's a, a very keen television and film watcher. It really is a beautiful, elegant dress. Where did you finish It's very nerve-wracking standing in a lineup like that, waiting for your handshake. <laughs> You can just see Ludo in the background there behind oh, yes. the prince. <laughs> He's being very well behaved. <laughs> Princess charming her guests there. The royal couple are also meeting Jerry Esbin, who's head of distribution for TriStar Pictures, Steve Randall, who's head of marketing for TriStar. And Steve Cleon, who's Vice President for Worldwide Publications and Advertising, TriStar Pictures. strange little monster lurking in the background of all of these uh, photographs we're seeing. <laughs> Further along the line, they're meeting Lester McKellar, who's Executive General Manager, Columbia Cannon Warner, and Bob Beecher, who's Managing Director of the Henson Company. <laughs> It obviously seems a very happy occasion, and Jim Henson, whose special night it is, I suppose, seemed thrilled at the whole occasion. Marvellous to see a movie that you conceived in the first place actually reach the screen. It must really cap it all. But not only to reach the screen, but to have such a wonderful start as a royal premiere, as you said. <laughs> There's Terry Jones, who wrote the screenplay. <laughs> the man thinks monsters and goblins. Terry Jones, that is. Terry Jones, <laughs> not the prince. <laughs> I think he appreciates them. I wonder if he's a sort of Monty Python fan, Prince Charles. I'm sure he must be. Oh, look, <laughs> the monster's getting interested. <laughs> And is this your particular yeah, so <laughs> 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 This is dream. <laughs> well, nice, nice. <laughs> Brian Prude, who's 
conceptual designer. It was actually his idea of the labyrinth, and his son is starring in the film. And it's because his son is snatched by the goblins, led by David Bowie, that Jennifer Connolly, playing Sarah, goes off through the labyrinth to retrieve him. We, we ought to introduce Ludo at this point. He is, in fact, a very friendly monster. Yes. Isn't he? he's, a, he's a monster with a heart of gold. And there's Jim Henson standing next to Jim Henson's on the right, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not totally sure I'm believing what I'm seeing at the moment. And I think Prince no, Charles Prince feels Charles. the same. <laughs> Trying to make some sense of him. <laughs> to be quite serious, it is a brilliant, brilliant monster. He is. He's lovely. He's so lifelike. So Look big. at the way he's frowning now. Wondering what's going don't, on. Don't you think that has to be the picture of tomorrow's <laughs> papers? Yes. And there, of course, is young Jennifer Connolly meeting the prince. <laughs> Jennifer Connolly there. She was 14 when she made the film. And she's now at the grand old age of 15. And packed it into her school holidays. Exactly. <laughs> Yes, Ludo is one of the team of monsters, or strange companions, that goes with Sarah, Jennifer Connolly, through the labyrinth to Goblin City. A curtsy. Only a director of Sir Richard Attenborough's stature, I think, could have got that monster to curtsy to a princess. And now it's bouquet time. Young Natasha Graham here. She's the daughter of Mrs. Andrew Graham, who's one of the members of the special premier committee. She will be presenting the bouquet to the Princess of Wales. Just after she's finished talking to Jennifer Connolly. Who I know has been really looking forward to meeting Princess Diana tonight. Mm. Yes, and Ludo is agreeing with everything they're saying. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you to Natasha Graham for the presentation of the bouquet. And Paul Hardcastle, who is Leslie Hardcastle's son, is presenting the souvenir brochure. And so the royal party move into the auditorium to join Jennifer and her strange companions on their mission to Goblin City. We hope you've enjoyed our little preview of tonight's royal premiere. From Nick and me, a very good night. Good night. <laughs>